Hey, Tactical Painter back out in the Suits Crafting Woodshop. Welcome back out to the shop. So, we've made some progress today on some of the uh, testing that I was going to be doing on the Aurora Borealis blanks, the Cosmos blanks, and on the Coastal Sunset blanks that uh, we've, been, we've been talking about for a few weeks now. So, I've got a bin right here full of the blanks. Um, I got my pressure pot rack all set up and it's ready to go and so we got that set up. Uh, I did do a video on that so let's go ahead and cut to that real quick, show you how to set that up and then we'll get to showing these babies off. Alright, so let's go ahead and get this rack system put together. So in order to do this, you lay all your parts out. You've got uh, four components. You've got your base, three shelves, three side panels, your riser panels, and then your lid and then a bag of screws. So let's go ahead and get this put together. We can take our shelves, we can set those to the side for now. You are going to need some sort of screwdriver, whether it want to be a hand screwdriver or uh, a drill. Now it is helpful to have one with a variable speed and put it on slowest setting um, so that you don't over tighten these. Now all the sides are exactly the same so what you're going to do is you're going to take your base and you can see that it has three flat sides. Those flat sides correlate with this dado that's cut into here. So you're just going to take your flat side and you're going to line it up on here and then you're just going to screw that in just like that. Now you need to have your base set flat onto a surface whether it be you know a tabletop or whatnot um, in order to put these together. So let's get our screws out and we're going to screw that in. Now the last three screws are for our top, so we're going to go ahead and remove this paper backer. There's that. Now if you choose to, especially if you have it engraved, you can clean it off with just a little bit of denatured alcohol. Just wipe off the engraving there and get all of the leftover stickiness from that paper that was on there cleaned off. And you wipe off the top, get it all nice and clean before we apply this on there. So that's all nice and clean, so we'll just take that and we will screw those in. Now I'm just going to get each one of these in there and get them started so it's all lined up. Before I tighten them all down. And there we go. Our rack system is all set up. So let me lower you down there and get you a better angle so that way you can see some features about this rack system. Now the rack system is pretty neat. It's got these shelves here and the shelves are all HDPE and they all have on the underside these grooves and those grooves uh, serve a very special purpose. So when you slide the shelves in you're going to see that there's a rounded edge which is this top part here, and it's got three flat edges. Those flat edges correlate with the sides, so what you do is you line those up in the grooves, slide it all the way back, and then those grooves actually lock the shelf in place so that it doesn't move. So it's a pretty neat idea for him to do that. Um, the only thing that you have to watch out for is if you put too much weight on the front, it'll rock like that and that rocking will can allow it to slide out so you want to make sure that if you put weight on it you push it to the back so that it keeps that locked in place and flat.
And like I said, it does come with three of those. So you can put all three of them in and you have enough there to run a lot of pen blanks or bottle stoppers or whatever whatever your heart's desire is. Let's see. It's hard to do backwards. And there we go. So it's a nice racking system. Really happy with that. Now if we take this bottom shelf out we can see here's my two inch by one and a half inch uh, bottle stopper mold and that fits beautifully onto the bottom rack there with room to spare. And then I can even put more pen blank molds on the center and on the top here. So plenty of room and there's even room probably for four or five of those at the same time. So that works out pretty well. So the pressure pot rack is actually really easy to set up and it fits beautifully. Now I got that set up because the next step was going to be casting all these up. I made some little HDPE spacers so I could cast up two blanks per um, length, you know, full length blanks and it separates it so I could do two individual colors per blank slot in the uh, the P-Town Subby molds that I got. And so I've got now 10 uh, of these uh, blanks and they turned out pretty spectacularly. I'm really happy with them. The molds worked really well. I did use mold release on it and I'll run either run the video here in the corner so you guys can see it or or what or I'll do something with it but turned out really nice um, these worked really well love the rack uh, it was really helpful because I had that four blank mold that I set up six of them in and then I had a two blank mold that I had another four in and so I just went through I mixed up a big batch it was about 300 grams of resin and then poured out 30 grams into each uh, little uh, two ounce uh, condiment cups and then added each of the colors to it um, and then once I did all that I stirred them all up threw them in the into the molds and then put those onto the rack, loaded the rack in, and pressurized it. And I got pretty close, actually. I was sitting at about 15 minutes from the time that I started mixing all of the resin together to the time that I got it in the pressure pot. So it was, it was really close. But uh, I had 10 sample packs from Solar Color Dust that I wanted to test out for the, the different pen blanks that I'm looking at putting out. And... And so we'll just go ahead and look through those here. Now after I got those all into the pressure pot, I went through and I popped them all out, showed them to the camera, and then I put labels on each and every single one so that I could keep them straight as to what they were because they all have different names. So like this one here, this is Red Violet Blue, RVB for Red Violet Blue, and it looks really neat. Um, it's got a really good transition between uh, red, violet, and blue, and I don't know that I'm going to get an angle to pick that up. So to you guys, it probably just looks green, because that's kind of like the when all the colors mix together of whatever the um, oxide is that they have in there with the, the pigments um, attached to that makes it so it changes colors when the light hits it. Somehow it works. <laughs> um... It, it gives it off a green and some of the other ones have different colors that they give off uh, initially like these ones they have like a, a reddish hue to them um, and this one is yellow green and red and it's like almost always has like this reddish orange hue to it instead of like this one that has a slight green tint to it um, but they worked out pretty well now this yellow green red I was thinking of doing this one for the uh, sunset, you know, for the either the sun or the sunset itself, because um, in the pictures the green doesn't really show up. But when I look at it uh, in hand, sometimes the green kind of shows up through his stripes, and I don't think that'll make a very good sunset. So that one's out of there. Um, one good one that I think will work really well for the uh, for the sun would be this uh, this red gold. And let's see if I can get that to show up on camera there. There, you can kind of see the transition. There you go, right there. You can see that transition from red to gold. Um, I think that'll work okay for the sun. Um, not so much for the sky. The sky doesn't, you know, go yellow. <laughs> it goes, you know, reds and oranges and pinks and then, you know, blues and violets. Uh, but it doesn't really ever go 
yellow that you know you see too often so but I think for the sunshine that gold looks really really cool and then turning red I think will be a good good option so that one I think we're gonna hold on to uh, another one that I tested out for the sun and sunset is this blue purple yellow green I was kinda curious about how this one would turn out and this one is a, it's a cool color uh, but it's not for what I'm going for so it just does not have the effects that I want it's got this kind of odd mauve background color to it. it's another one of the the reddish hued backgrounds and I, I'm not a huge fan of it it might look different if I were to drill into it paint it uh, the inside black and then turn it round it might change how it appears so I, I think I'm going to test that on some of these because I, I just don't know how they'll turn out. But if the green comes up at all, which it kind of does when I'm looking at it, um, I don't think it's going to work for, for the sunset. I was really hopeful, um, you know, being blue, purple, yellow, and green, that it would work for that. But it's just got this reddish hue to it that I, I'm not a huge fan of. So that's being our maybe pile. <laughs> Now this one I'm a huge fan of. This is a uh, purple, blue, green, and I I was looking at this one for the Aurora Borealis because that's got all three colors of the Aurora Borealis. And uh, let's see if I can get that to transition for you. You can see some of it there. Um, and for the Aurora, I think it was going to look pretty cool. Um, you know, it's got all the colors that you you know you usually see purple, blue, and green, but. Uh, there, there are some others in here that I, I think would work better, but I'm going to keep that, you know, because it's I think it's going to be a good one. This red, purple, blue version two is what this one is. Red, purple, blue version two. This one is neat. I like this one. It's got really good color transition, which you of course can't see as well, uh, but it's got good color transition. The, the pigment flakes are a little bigger they almost have like a sparkle or a twinkle to them that uh, is really appealing to the eye I don't know how well it's going to look once it's turned round if that different size from the other ones are going to affect it as much but we'll just have to see now this other one here this one's green and blue, and I got this one thinking uh, green and blue is going to be a good one for um, the Aurora Borealis. I'm going green and blue. It's green and blue. But it's got this red hue background that is not at all what I want when I'm doing the Aurora Borealis. The red, reddish pink, mauve, whatever you want to call it, um, kind of drowns out the green-blue transition, and it doesn't really even transition to blue because it's got that red in the background, it goes green violet. It's not what I want at all. It just goes green violet, not green blue. The blue doesn't show up nearly as prevalent as the green does. It just kind of looks violet because of that red background. Now that may be different. It's it is very see-through, um, so it may be different once I paint it black on the inside. That red may just disappear, and then all you see left is the green blue. So I'm just going to have to experiment and see. Now this one's cool all on its own. Uh, this one is uh, Blue Green Gold version 2. And it's pretty neat. I do like this one. Um, it transitions pretty nicely. Um, the gold is very, very obvious in it. Um, it's got these really beautiful gold uh, like flakes and dots in it. Very see-through as you can see my, my finger there behind it. Um, but it's it's a pretty cool color I like the color I don't know if I would if I'm gonna use this for anything but it's uh, it's pretty cool one overall I think I'll turn it up and then we'll just see how it turns out and see what it looks like in the end that one was blue green gold v2 here's blue green gold version 1 and this one has more uh, color and less space so this one's not nearly as see-through there you can't hardly see my finger go through behind it. The pigment fills this one in a lot more. The particles are a lot smaller with version one of the blue green gold. And uh, I kind of like this one better than the version two. And I'm, I'm thinking that this is going to be 
uh, my Aurora Borealis. It's got a good transition between the green and blue that I can see clearly. And then that gold comes through occasionally and just gives it just a little, little brighter flip. And uh, I, I do like this one. So I'm definitely going to be giving that one a shot. See what it looks like. Then our last one here is just a standard blue-green. And this one, by far, uh, I, I like this one a lot. It's got small particles. Uh, they're kind of glittery. Uh, really small particles, but they've got like a little twinkle to them. And then the transition is gorgeous. It goes from a green-blue really nicely. Um, and it's by far my favorite uh, for the Aurora Borealis. So that you've got the blue-green and then the blue-green gold that I'm going to try out for the Aurora Borealis. And then I'm thinking this red-violet blue. I'm going to be trying this one out for the uh, Cosmos blanks because I've been using um, a violet blue and it works really well for the Cosmos blanks. But that extra little transition into the red I think is a really cool effect. And then um, my Nebula Blanks, I'd already been doing a mix of uh, Perlex powders, red, blue, and violet. And then I swirl those all together inside of black. And uh, I think having the red, violet, blue, it's just got all three of those all in one. If I wait until the resin is just about to start um, gelling over and then mix it all together, um, I might be able to get the red, violet, and blue all to show up all at the same time. And then they'll twist and change colors as you change the angle that the light comes through it. So I think that this one is going to be uh, my new uh, Cosmos blank. So this one is just it's spectacular. I love it. Now the red, purple, blue V2, the particles are a little larger in here. Um, it's got a really good transition. Um, it, it's a, it's a runner-up for doing the, the Cosmos blanks. And then, of course, this red gold, I think it's going to be great for sunset. Now, I still need to figure out how I'm going to do the sky for my sunset, uh, but I think this is going to be a great color for my sun uh, in order to uh, to get a good sun transition from yellow to red. Um, it, you know, because the, the gold that's in here, it, uh, let's see if I can get an angle on that. It's a really nice yellowish gold color. Um, a little bit of an antique color gold to it. Uh, but that's okay. I, I like how it turns out. I'll have to uh, uh, drill it, paint it black, and then see see how well that works. As well, this blue purple green. I'm gonna have to try that one out for the Aurora. The purple shows up as the secondary, like the blue green is always kind of there, and then you bring it up, and then the purple shows up. So that one I'm going to have to, that's, that's in the maybe pile. So I've got these organized here. I'm going to get these drilled. I'm going to paint the interiors of the tubes black. And then I'll paint the actual tubes black. Um, and then glue those in. And I'll get those tested up. Um, it probably won't be by next week. Uh, I've got a pretty busy schedule coming up. Uh, but uh, I'm going to go through and test a lot of these and just kind of see. Now when I, I set this up, I set these up so that they're all the length for a Sierra pen kit. So I'm just going to get some Sierra twist pens um, together and then get those set up and going. And then we'll just see how these turn out. Alright, so now as you guys are aware, I've been getting into doing some die stabilizing of blanks. And so I've got some of these red that I still need to get up on my website, so sorry I haven't done that yet. Um, but I've got some of these um, Maple Burrow blanks dyed red, and I'll, I'll get those up on the site here soon. Um, but one of the reasons why I, I hadn't uh, was because I, I, I've got something I wanted to test out. I've got these weird cutoff chunks, these weird cool pieces that uh, I was wanting to figure out a way that I can sell these, send them, and still have them dry. So let me show you what I came up with so I can get these sold off, but keep them dry while they're en route to you. Um, now for me in Oregon, this is a serious problem. You know, being in the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, it's raining out right now actually. Uh, it's a very humid area out here, and so we're always having to deal with moisture. And so let me show you what I came up with for selling these off to you guys. 
Now right here, I've got some stabilized pine cones. I went through, I uh, did a whole bunch of stabilizing last week, and I got a whole bunch of these pine cones stabilized up, like I showed you guys last time in, in my mail call. And inside here, in order to keep these dry, I've got these silica gel packs. Now, you guys get these a lot, like if you ever buy a bag of beef jerky, there's always this little tiny pack that says, do not eat. Uh, desiccant, you know, silica gel desiccant, do not eat. Um, that's what this is. This is a silica gel that uh, is blue when it's dry, and when it needs to be reactivated, it'll turn pink. And so these things are great because they're a color indicator, they tell you when they're wet or when the moisture content inside um, your, your container has exceeded the moisture level that they're designed for and usually it's like 25 or 30 percent the stuff inside will still be mostly dry but then the packs will start to turn pink and then the great thing about it you just take these you pop them in your oven uh, for a couple hours at 200 250 degrees they'll return blue you get all the water back out of them toss them right back in there and use them so when i ship out wood blanks i'm going to be including one desiccant pack so that way you guys can take those and you'll know that they're dry when you receive them if they've turned pink you just take the wood blank you toss it in the oven with the desiccant pack at 200 225 degrees for about an hour that'll dry the wood the surface of the wood back out it'll reactivate the desiccant pack and then you throw that inside of an airtight container uh, just like this it has a seal on it and then you lock that down and that will keep that totally dry. Um, and I, I threw three packs in this one because I had these pine cones sitting out uh, for four or five days uh, just out in the open air. So I know they absorb moisture, so I've got the desiccant packs in there, um, taking that moisture, wicking it back off of them. Um, I'll still throw them in an oven probably for about 30 minutes uh, in order to make sure that there's no moisture on the surface before casting with them. Uh, but when I ship these to you guys, you're gonna get a desiccant pack in there and then you can reuse that. So it's a really wonderful thing uh, that I just, uh, I discovered it about a year or two ago. Uh, these little desiccant packs found them on Amazon. You can get 50 of them for 10 bucks. They're not very expensive. Um, they're really easy to use, really easy to reactivate. And there's a 25 pack that I got two years ago that I've reactivated them all a couple of times and they keep all my stuff dry. So they work really well. I'm gonna start uh, selling off some of the odds and ends of pieces of things. So I've got, I've got like this one here from a piece of spalted maple burl that's stabilized. I've got you know some odds, little odds and ends and pieces. So I'll get these photographed, probably uh, number them or catalog them in some way. So that way you know exactly which one you're going to be buying. So there's some really cool ones in here. Um, some of other ones that are just pretty basic. Like this one just has just this uh, straight angle that just comes down like that and a flat back. And then one that does the exact same. So I'll probably sell those as a two pack. <clears throat> and then you can put that in your mold like so. And then that void in the middle will be your your uh, resin so you know you can do whatever you want with them um, and they'll work really well for you they're stabilized and as long as you keep them dry right before you put them in your resin uh, they'll work work really well now one reason why moisture content is so important I'll show you a pen that I just did this week um, this pen is for me so it wasn't a big deal that it happened but uh, this is one of those maple burl blanks uh, the little cutoffs that I just showed you I didn't have any desiccant packs in them yet, and it was a um, just an odd end cutoff section that I cast in the twilight. And if you look closely where the wood meets the resin, you can kind of see a white rim that goes all the way around it, and then around on the other side too. And that white rim is moisture. That they had just a little bit of moisture right at the top surface of the wood. Um, the stabilized wood won't absorb water, but it, what it will do is the outside of the wood is still kind of porous, and so moisture can get into those pores just at the surface level, and then it will cause your resin to be kind of whitish right at the level of the stabilized wood and the resin meet. And so it gives you a white line. It doesn't look terrible, and most people probably won't know 
a difference. I mean, and since this is like a galaxy, you know, night sky type of a deal, um, it just kind of looks like a, a layer of clouds right where the, like the mountainous pattern right there is at. You know, it doesn't look awful, but as resin casters, we know that it was actually a mistake. Um, so keep your wood dry and that won't happen. Now, this is a cool pen. I really like this. These are the Arite um, fountain pens and rollerball pens from Woodcraft. I actually picked these up a while back. I've been meaning to get one done. And I really like this pen. It's a cool pen. It's got this uh, Swarovski crystal in the clip. And it's all chrome. And then I've got the blue-violet color shifting uh, powders in there. Um, it's a 2764 uh, blank. So you drill it with the same one as you do for Sierras and for uh, Manhattans and what's the other one? Gatsby's. So 2764, so it's a very common drill bit. And then you drill that in, glue your tube in, um, and then you've got either, you can do either a fountain pen or a rollerball pen. And check out the fountain pen nib. This is one of the neatest fountain pen nibs that I have ever seen. This is, it's called a shrouded fountain pen nib. It's extra fine point fountain pen nib. And it is so cool. I really like it. And depending on your ink, it'll write smooth or it won't. You know, it can kind of be scratchy depending on your ink. I use, um, is it Noodler's ink? Um... So World War, one of their World War II series uh, blue. It's kind of like a cobalt blue, and it writes super smooth. I've been using it for years in all of my fountain pens. And so get yourself a high-quality ink if you're going to do a fountain pen because that can make all the difference on whether or not it writes smoothly or doesn't. Um, because your fountain pen tip, it's obviously it's not going to roll. It's just going to scratch unless you use a good ink. And the ink that came with it, it came like like this... Um, ink cartridge. I put that in it for a day, used that, and it was awful. It was just terrible ink. It, you could feel that it was scratchy. I took that sucker out when I got home that night, and I grabbed uh, a reservoir that I had, a, a spare reservoir, as the Schmidt push-in reservoir. Pup that puppy in there with my blue ink, and it writes fantastically. It's so smooth. Um, it's almost like writing with a, a gel uh, ink pen and it's just really nice. I really love it and I love the uh, the little galaxy section that's in there it turned out really cool so love that pen and uh, But wanted to show you guys what I mean when you know I talk about moisture You need to keep the moisture off the surface of your wood so that way your resin castings don't get ruined So now it wasn't ruined and it turned out really nice still uh, But it does have that line in there that I always know whenever I see it that that was a mistake other people, they don't even notice. They just go, oh, wow, cool, that looks like a galaxy. It's like, thanks, that's exactly the look I was going for. Uh, but I know that it's there, and it bugs me a little bit. But, you know, you can't always expect perfection. Um, but if this were a customer's pen, I would probably be redoing that because that would have bugged me. I wouldn't want to sell sold that like that. Um, and if somebody wants to buy this pen off of me, I'll probably tell them, no, but I'll make you one um, because I don't want that to go out and and be in someone's hands with those mistakes on there because that's just me you know I, I expect better quality from myself and so that's what you guys can expect from me is that I won't sell mistakes like that <laughs> well I guess I'm gonna wrap it up that week so sorry for the long length just those four items this week setting up the rack getting those blanks cast up for my testing and then selling off wood cutoffs and stabilized wood cutoffs and then the pen. So I just wanted to announce that stuff to you guys. And so I'm going to go ahead and cut it there. We'll see you guys back next week. I'm still working on the video on how to do the Editor G2 conversion. So you guys can still expect that out. It's almost done. I've got it in the last stage. I just have to go back through and watch it all again in order to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, because I actually do all my own vid video editing. But once I get that all cut up, and verified uh, then I will get that uploaded so probably here in the next couple of days you, get, you guys can expect to see that so thanks again for joining me out here in the suits crafting wood shop this is tactical painter signing out be sure to like share and subscribe throw a subscribe button right there in the middle as always check out some of my other videos here on the sides tactical painter signing out happy turning <laughs>